I feel kind of bad making him so nervous, but in case any of you need to know, uh, south of the IHOP Waffle House divide, you call it Southern Appalachia, which is the right way to say it, and not Southern Appalachia, which is the racist way to say it. And well, South Appalachia is just illiterate. <laughs> uh, it's not even wrong. So I'm Ryan Spears. Uh, I'm Travis Goodspeed. Um, Ryan and I have um, been working together for like a couple of, or several years now, through like random side projects uh, that began when Sergey Bratis blackmailed me into doing a wireless fingerprinting project in exchange for hitchhiking back to this lovely country from Canada. Yeah. Um, and like uh, a lot, somehow he had convinced me that wireless fingerprinting did not need to be boring because uh, you, you'll learn how the internals of these things actually work. Uh, and I forgot his explanation about it. So like the next day I said, well, Sergey, you convinced me of this, but I still think that you're full of shit. Because um, like, you're, you're doing all of the effort necessary to get an exploit, and at the end, all you know is that this thing is not like that thing in this way, maybe kind of, sort of. Um, the end result of that was that uh, Ryan and I, with Sergey and Bex, Bex and, yeah. um, and a few other folks, we came up with this attack called Packet and Packet, where we could actually inject a wireless layer one packet given control of only layer seven data without a software bug just by messing with the physical Mac layer. Yeah, physical, uh, and Mac physical layer. like layer one properties of the ether. Um, which was like one of the greatest exploits I've ever had the privilege of working on. Um, here we're, we're not yet to that level, but we're like exploring that space and we, we strongly believe that there are techniques that will allow you to mess with CPUs and with emulators in variable length uh, risk instruction sets by abusing the ways in which they violate the risk philosophy. Because um, risk was designed in uh, an older era. In, in the risk ideal, each instruction is one word. Well, variable length risk blows that to hell. You know, you have multiple word instructions now. And in the risk ideal, the compiler needs to make up for any mistake or omission in the CPU, right? So, you know, your CPU mis-executes an instruction, well, the compiler can fix that. You know, it's like the, uh, in the same way that Itanium sort of pushes all of the optimization burden to the compiler, show of hands if you run Itanium. Oh, no one, okay, good. There's that one guy in the back, and I feel really bad for him. I'm the last guy who uses Spark on Linux. Like, I'll buy you a beer afterward. Uh, we can share stories. So, um, so this, like, uh, the smaller, the compressed risk instruction sets, like MIPS 16, uh, Thumb, uh, MSP430X, uh, they violate a lot of the rules that we came to expect in standard risk, and the emulators don't really know what to do with them, and the reverse engineering tools don't really know what to do with them. So, like, IDA Pro being written for first for x86 and then ported, it is very comfortable with the idea of an instruction being more than one byte long. Um, but the hardware is not comfortable with the instruction being more than one instruction word long. And we can abuse this difference. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and just jump into some of the theory about that, right? So to review, on x86, we have this idea. We have variable length instructions, as Travis said, all over the place. Um, you can do fun reverse engineering, obfuscation by jumping to the middle of an instruction, causing it to be a different instruction. All types of fun, crafty, one might say malicious, but I disagree, uses for that type of behavior, right? But risk is supposed to be simpler. On risk, we're supposed to have fixed length instructions. Uh, how, how long is uh, an ARM instruction? Well, four bytes. How long is an x86 instruction? Who the hell knows? <laughs> um, what's, what's the official limit, like 96 bytes? Uh, it's not 96, but it's large. Somewhere. 15, okay, yeah. 
I think 96 is stretching it. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think QEMU, uh, their software implementation goes a bit longer. We should test that next. Like how many pages can you make an instruction? Yeah. <laughs> so in, in RISC, they're supposed to be fixed length. That means they can be aligned, right? They should all be on those four byte boundaries. And the processor, and often because of the memory management and the bus, it can't jump to the middle of an instruction, right? So, yeah, that's so great. like in, in classic RISC, you can screw up a lot of things, but you know that every four bytes there's a new instruction. You are never confused as to where an instruction begins. And as a reverse engineer, this is great because, you know, any large contiguous region with valid code, well, that's probably a function. Function identification in classic RISC is infinitely simpler than it is on x86. Uh, reverse engineering in, of um, like a, a blob or a, a dump that came from partial memory without the loader information is a lot easier on these platforms. But it's not that simple, right? Because we had these uppity embedded market developers who wanted higher performance, smaller code sizes, right? And so tried to look at what you could do about this. And risk is, in general, about 30% larger than x86. How can we get that code size down? And that's where a lot of these uh, updated instruction sets come in, right? Can we get them down to 16-bit wide instructions? But oh wait, you can't really fit everything into 16 bits. So the length can sort of vary. So the first thing that you do when you have a 16 bit instead of a 32 bit wide instruction length, um, the first thing that you do is you have constant pools. In traditional RISC, you have something like a load immediate instruction, uh, which on PowerPC or MIPS would be a load immediate high or load immediate low. And what this means is that you're taking the lower half of the instruction word, and you're loading that into either the upper half or the lower half of a given register. Um, so then you have two 32-bit words that load one 32-bit word into a register. In ARM and in uh, compressed RISC, you don't do that. Instead, you have constant pools. So you say, like, the 32-bit word that is so far down the line, so many words after the program counter, I want that loaded into register 7. And this way, you're mixing instructions and data, which classic RISC wouldn't do because it was designed to be sort of Harvard compatible. Um, but modern RISC does because on a modern machine, you are going to pretend to be von Neumann even if that's not how you're wired internally. With embedded, um, like the, the shortened RISC form, uh, you don't have the option of that much space. You're not gonna load a 32-bit instruction in four instruction words, because it wastes too many clock cycles. So instead what you do is you just reference down the line, you load the whole thing at once, and then you have these constant pools of data that sit between your functions. Uh, as a reverse engineer, this is great because they sort of stay out of your way, and they're very easy to patch. So looking at these modes, right, so we have ARM, and then it added thumb mode to be this smaller size. MIPS added MIPS 16. PowerPC added PowerPC VLE. MSP430 actually went the other way and became MSP430X. But looking at all of these, we sort of asked ourselves the question, can we find where we can split these instructions apart, reattach them, and confuse reverse engineers, emulators, and their tools? Right? How can we mess with those tools? Which means we're basically trying to do something called Finding Bugs in Processor Instruction Manuals, which, as we learned, is a little tougher than we thought. So when, when you start looking at these instruction manuals, you can find all sorts of uh, ideas for where the implementation might disagree with the description. Then you realize that commercial CPU designers actually use test cases instead of just pretending to use test cases. Um, like they, they really, really do, disappointing. They really do watch out for things being bad. Um, the better hardware design houses, um, at least mythology has it that they have three testers per design uh, per coder. Um, in reality, I think they do have like one, uh, which, which is, is still, still far better than you find at any software shop. 
So we wanted to jump into a few fundamentals to get you set. You may be coming from an x86 mindset. You may even be coming from a Windows mindset where you think that a word is something that MSDN decided to call something, right? Where a word or a D word, but no. No, a word is it what MSDN taught us, including myself, was tricked into this. When we talk in this presentation, you may think we're wrong. No, it's actually on purpose. We're not wrong about this, at least. Uh, one word, when we say a word, we mean the width of the instruction, which is, in some cases, different than the width of the register. So all of these CPUs that we're talking about are 32-bit architectures, except for MSB430, which is 16-bit, and MSB430X, which is 20-bit. The uh, ARM, the MIPS, the PowerPC variants that we're talking about, they all have 32-bit wide registers, including the program counter. They can address the 32-bit memory space. Um, what we're talking about are the instruction words, which were 32 bits as these platforms were initially designed, and then were reduced to 16 bits in order to compete with x86 and with um, similar instruction sets for space. Because you don't want to spend 30% more on code memory storage. You would much rather use as little memory as necessary. So let's go back looking at these, right? So we have these reduced risk instruction sets that we mentioned, the, the small versions to the normal ones. And in a lot of these, and it depends, we'll go into in a few slides exactly how, uh, but switching is generally easy. If you can switch, let's look at ARM for an example. Right, you have a BX or a BLX instruction, and when you call that, uh, in the ARM state, if the least significant bit is one, then you go to thumb mode, um, which means that all instructions at thumb modes are offset at odd addresses, and if you're in thumb state and you have an LSB of zero, when you go and hit the branch, you go to ARM mode, so all of those are, are even aligned. Uh, this is particularly great because um, your functions, having different machine languages, they remain compatible because the least significant bit of a function pointer tells the CPU which instruction set to execute when it gets there. And similarly, the least significant bit of the return pointer tells it which instruction set to return to. So you can freely mix these instruction sets and bounce back and forth between ARM and thumb or between uh, MIPS and MIPS 16 within a single program or if you're really greedy about it, even though compilers don't seem to do this, you can bounce back and forth inside of a single function, reliably and without consequences. Yeah. Um, now, when they're adding support for this smaller instruction set, uh, RISC sort of like spent its, ex its extra complexity on a couple of things. One thing that it spent the complexity on was the register set. You have a lot more registers in MIPS than you have on x86. So when they're reducing the, the range from a 32-bit wide instruction down to a 16-bit wide instruction, you can't really have the 32 general purpose registers that you expected before. Like MIPS wastes an entire general purpose register for nothing other than the number zero. The, the register zero is always the value zero when you read it, and you never write to it because it ignores all writes. And this is just sort of sitting there wasting space. So when they had a chance to redesign it, they had fewer registers, but they need the two to be compatible in order to do function calls between them. So this diagram here on the right actually shows which of the MIP16 registers in the left map to the greater register set on the right and as they do this, they skip over a lot of registers that might be uh, preserved while maintaining a few that are clobbered. Clobber registers are ones that you can freely modify, but when you call another function, you can't expect them to be the same when that function returns. They also make sure that the first two parameter registers are available. So you're, when you have a C function, the calling convention is actually specified in MIPS, and it's the same for all programs. This is great if you have firmware and you want to relink it into a Linux executable in order to run it on your desktop. Uh, because in embedded MIPS, you have the same calling convention as you have in desktop MIPS. Uh, and this connection connects the two. 
So, uh, you know, MS, so now we're going to jump into a specific example, and we're going to use MSP430 as sort of an illustrative version of some of these strange different length instruction sets. So, uh, you know, in MSP430, which if you aren't familiar with it, is a TI chip, and, and Travis is, tends to be one of the people who have looked at this the most uh, as a reverse engineer out of, out of anyone, I think. Um, it, by default, has a 64K address space, limited RAM and peripherals. So they looked at it, they're like, hey, we have 16-bit wide instructions. We need some more space. So they did MSP430X. This adds some new instructions, as well as a prefix instruction to extend the basic ones. This is different from our other examples in that MSP430 grew from a 16-bit chip to a 20-bit chip, while our other examples are 32-bit chips trying to become as instruction length efficient as a 16-bit chip. Um, so this is uh, the concept of a prefix word. Um, MSP430X is a superset of the MSP430 instruction set in that it only adds new instructions and it does not remove any of the existing ones. But there's not enough space for them to do that without, um, without like, tearing away the existing ones if they were to keep all of the opcodes in the first word. So what they do instead is they have prefix words. And the prefix word is not an instruction all its own. Instead, what it does is it says that it's, it's changing how the next instruction will execute. So for example, you can add uh, four bits to the source value or four bits to the destination address in order to extend those things from the 16 bits of the original instruction set to the 20 bit address space of the new instruction set. And these prefixes get added on top of whatever existing word were already there. So if you try to disassemble or reverse engineer MSP430X code with an MSP430 disassembler, uh, OBJ dump from GNU Binutils is particularly guilty of this. Um, it will not understand the prefix word, but it does understand the following word. So it's sort of like half successfully disassembles the instruction. Um, Ida Pro does this perfectly. Radara 2 doesn't understand the extensions at all. Um, so like the, the tool that the reverse engineer is using sort of changes his view of the instruction. And also, the um, there are like quite a few um, examples of programs that rarely use this extended instruction set. So like the bootloader on the MSP430 chips in the modern generation use this only for when they're writing above the 64 kilobyte boundary at the end of the 16-bit address space. So in the entire bootloader, there are four instructions that use this extension word. And there being so few instructions, you can disassemble it and think that you have a clean disassembly and you're missing just a little bit. So if you were writing malicious code for this platform, you could hide a malicious behavior inside of this uh, invalid instruction as far as the disassembler would know, and it would sort of sneak through. So let's look at, uh, you know, in this case, we add this prefix instruction, it changes the behavior of the next one, and we want you to keep this concept in mind because when we talk about MIPS 16 later, you'll see this same concept again. And from the different instruction sets and the different types we've talked about, there's sort of a few different grammars or styles that tend to be used. Right? So we've shown you the prefixes just now that Travis talked about. That's common in MSP430X. It's used in MIPS 16. Whereas in the other two, in, in thumb two mode at least, thumb one's a little different, we'll get into that later, um, and PowerPC VLE, they use longer instructions that are actually their own instructions instead of prefixing them. So thumb is like the little bit at the end of your arm, and uh, thumb two is an extension of that to be self-sufficient. So when thumb first came out in 2001, 2002, they, they had the idea that you would write most of your program in ARM and then have a function or two written in Thumb in order to save space. Thumb 2 is designed for chips that can't do 32-bit ARM, but all of your cell phones do both instruction sets and can freely flip between them. Now, when Thumb 1 was written, 
All of the instructions were a single word except for branch and link. When thumb two was written, they added a lot more two word long instructions in order to be more efficient. We'll get back to this in a bit. Uh, if you jump back one more. Uh, the PowerPC VLE, um, this you will almost only find in Freescale chips that are used almost entirely in the automotive industry. Uh, you should not expect to find this on an IBM Power workstation or server. You will not find this on an older Macintosh. Um, and PowerPC VLE flips very differently. They do not do the least significant bit trick. Instead, what they do is the memory management unit has a bit per page that describes which instruction set should be executed. Um, so your calling convention is, in, is sort of like made compatible by the MMU rather than by the pointer. So let's go ahead and look at some specific targets. And as Travis just mentioned, we're going get to uh, get going and looking into thumb mode. Right? So in thumb mode, both thumb one and thumb two, there's 16 bit wide instructions, but, but not always, right? Some, like Travis mentioned, are branch and link immediate that are 32 bits. And if you look at these from the manual that's on the right hand side, you sort of see they're broken up into two parts. Uh, the first one, the second one. And in thumb one, those are actually different instructions. So we yep. thought, hey, in thumb two, maybe it still makes the mistake and we can slip something in the middle. Now, when we say that these are two separate instructions, we mean that both here and there, you have an opcode. So each half of this wide instruction, the instruction being two words long, two 16-bit words long, um, each half has its own op instruction opcode. So in thumb one, these can run separately. Continue. In thumb two, we tried. And this is what it would look like, right? So we said, OK, let's take the code at the top. We have this branch, the, the BL, uh, up in the top code. We said, hey, let's go ahead and move our NOP that we put in just for padding purposes so we didn't have to fix up uh, offsets. Let's put it in the middle of those two. Now, it correctly looks like you know, an undefined instruction. This is what we wanted. We wanted the disassembler to get confused. However, in thumb two, that doesn't work. It actually does what the manual said. Really if, disappointing. If you jump back two slides. So the reason why Thumb 2 fails to execute this is that um, this screenshot is taken from the Thumb 2 definition. When we first made this attempt, we were reading from the original Thumb definition. Um, here you see that the opcode is uh, 11110. So you must begin with an F. You must follow with something that does not include the 8-bit. Over here, you'll see J1 and J2. What happened was that they harvested these bits that used to be the opcode in order to extend the range. So that now the branch and link function call can be two bits wider, making for four times the space between the caller and the callee. And this bit us. Yeah, so we think it should be still possible in thumb one. Uh, now we have a question for you. Does, does anyone give a shit about thumb one, right? And if so, do you have any hard, uh, thumb one hardware we can test it on? Because we got to this point where we're like, listen, we think it's exploitable on thumb one. And looking at it in the disassembler, we know that if it is, which we strongly believe it is, uh, it will be a pain to reverse engineer. Uh, can we get a shout out for the Sharp Zaris SL5500? That no one uses. Oh, oh, okay. He, does, he doesn't want to stand up. He doesn't want to like, draw any attention to himself, but he, he totally still rocks one. That's great. Carry that around you your pocket. You have a compact flash Wi-Fi card, or you do? Okay, oh, cool. Yeah. Is, is it an Orinoco 2 or a Prism? It's an Orinoco. Shout out for the Orinoco. Woo! <laughs> Luckily, uh, it's not firmware upgradable, so you should be safe. Oh, oh wait. So then we looked at this and we said, you know, when we tried this, we basically triggered an undefined exception interrupt, right? So, hey, what can we do with that, Travis? Okay, so in embedded ARM, you know, you are the operating system. And if you're trying to combat reverse engineering, you control everything. It's not like when you're writing an exploit and you have very few degrees of freedom and you're trying to gain code execution somewhere else. 
in someone else's program where someone else has written all of the interrupt handlers and there's an operating system to deal with. So in, uh, in ARM, you can actually hook the exception from the invalid instruction interrupt. And you can make a handler for that. And that handler can do a couple of things. The simplest thing would be to say, like, oh, this is invalid, but I'm just trying to mess with reversers' heads. So I'm going to ignore it and let things pass along. And then you can have like inline assembly blocks that have invalid instruction sets. And you can make your entire program like 30, 40% invalid instructions. And you'll have overhead from the instruction handlers. But when the reverse engineer gets to it and gets what is a clean disassembly, he'll think, oh, no, this can't possibly be right, and skip by it. And Ida Pro's auto analyzer will see these invalid instructions, think that the function can't be real, and ignore it. And then you, you've like raised the bar just, just enough that anyone reversing it needs to know how to patch their reverse engineering tools in order to accept these invalid instructions or to rewrite the binary. Um, this device here is a Titera MD380. It is a, a handheld ham radio that's popular in China. It's, um, so Titera is the minimum semantic distance like the minimum hamming distance from Hytera, which is another brand of radios that competes with it. And I managed to take the firmware out of this and reverse engineer it and add all sorts of extra features to it. But one of the other things that I did was I just turned it into a Linux executable with two or three pages of C code as a main function so that I can call its audio codec. And this is how I convert packet captures to audio files or construct packet captures out of audio files in order to inject back into a network. Like if you want to take Rick Astley and you want the properly composed minimum artifact version of that for the Moto Turbo or DMR protocols, you need this running as a Unix command line tool. By using tricks like this, you can, make, you can modify the machine language of an embedded system so that illegal instructions are quietly passed by and any reverse engineer who doesn't know to look for that same trick will wind up with uh, an emulated executable that triggers a bus error every fourth or fifth instruction. So having this background, right, and looking at ARM, let's move into MIPS, right? And so to start on this, we have to read up on the instruction set architecture for MIPS. So being good, you know, studious readers, and maybe we should have done this earlier, we opened the many, many page manual and saw that we can clearly get this information in many ways, including through the automated fax system. Now, <laughs> when we wrote this, we said we didn't try, but... Okay, so we're like rehearsing the slides earlier in the back room, and we get to this slide, and I said it didn't try, and I thought, you know, we, we really ought to try this. So I whip out my phone, and I call the 800 number, and it, I get a busy signal. Hmm. It doesn't dial. Um, then I try the local number for those outside the United States who, like, you know, they won't accept the toll call. And it rings, and it rings, and it rings, and there's no pickup. And then I, it switches to voicemail, and I, I hear this recording. It's like, hi, you have reached the offices of Joy Mordeaux. If you'd... Joy Cauldron. Yeah. Joy Cauldron. Yeah, if you'd yeah. please leave a message, you know. So we apologize for the message on Joy's machine. No, we were, we were just trying to tell her that we thought her phone number was really cool and that uh, she should know about MIPS history. But apparently that number is no longer kept for the automated fax service for MIPS. So I apologize for this diagram for anyone who's now having terrible flashbacks or good ones to their like, college computer architecture course, right? But we need to understand the MIPS pipeline a little bit for what we're going to do next. Um, uh, and so, so, so yeah. Ryan and I both first saw this diagram in the Patterson and Hennessy book as undergrads. And then we both saw the diagram again in the um, Hennessy and Patterson book in a grad school course. And like, we, we were both like, uh, having both views of it, in that we both hate this diagram and have awful memories of the books by those two brilliant researchers. And we both have lovely memories of them because uh, we wound up having them both with uh, an excellent teacher and with one who maybe hadn't written in machine language. 
<laughs> and um, like, if you read it the right way, if you go through this course uh, as, when it's taught well, you actually make a MIPS clone in Verilog. You learn how the pipeline exists physically and how multiple instruction sets can survive in the pipeline together at the same time, and you understand why the delay slot exists. And if you have this the less than lovely way, um, you wind up never wanting to look at any machine internals ever again, and you've done a lot of multiplying and dividing fractions in order no to guess reason. at how efficient they would execute. Um, but either way, you should remember that um, as these things run through the pipeline, when you have a branch, if the CPU does not execute the instruction after the branch, well, that instruction is already almost done. It is not quite to the write back phase at the very end, but it's very close. So it's not that you're saving work by not executing it, it's that you're wasting work by throwing it away and flushing the pipeline. And pipeline flushes are inefficient. So risk doesn't want to do them. So when you have really good out of order execution, this becomes less of an issue. But when risk became a thing, there was no good out of order execution. And what they would do instead is they would just make it a part of the assembly documentation that the very next word after a branch would be executed anyways, and the assembler programmer should be smart enough to prepare for this. So the way that this works in a function return in MIP16 is that you have E820, which is the return, and this is followed by 6500, which is a NOP. Now I want you to marvel at the efficiency that we are running that NOP without having to pay for it. Free NOP. Okay, but if we were to do something useful there, like let's say that the function needs to do some complicated math and then add one to it at the end. Well then we can have a 4A01 and we can do that addition for free. And this addition actually happens after the return, but before the first instruction from the calling function. So it might as well have happened inside of it. Ida is smart enough to place this inside of the function as it separates apart the basic blocks uh, because it knows that it's being executed inside of the, the child function and not the parent that called it. But let's see what else we could put there because adding one's not interesting. What can we do that's a little more crafty, right? So we tried a lot of things. Uh, first tried to put a prefix word on the knob which is uh, one of those prefix instructions we talked about earlier. So like, we, we, we tried to take a NOP and say to the CPU, like, look, we want you to run this NOP, but the NOP has an immediate value, and we want you to add five zeros before the beginning of that immediate value. And we got a bus error because the CPU knew that that was ridiculous and didn't want to run it. Um, so we thought about like an extension word within a delay slot. So you've got like, an extension word within a delay slot, and an extension word changes the instruction after it. So it doesn't really do anything itself, and that makes it like, uh, a little bit special. So what we found was that only one word was actually fetched by the hardware, because in the hardware implementation, the delay slot is not that the hardware intends to execute the next instruction, it's that it's already happening and it might as well continue, right? It was already fetched. So the program counter changes before the following instruction is fetched. And maybe that means that it's different from a regular instruction pair. So what we did is we set up an experiment around this concept, right? What could we do that was unique in this slot? So thank you, Travis, for the beer. Um, so first we made a function, let's assume that in this function we just, and this is what we did, we, we put a zero into the v1 ver uh, value. And then we set up what other things can we run after that, and then let's run this on both hardware, and let's run it on QMU, simulating somebody trying to simulate, do reverse engineering or malware analysis on this. And let's see what we saw. Okay, so just to review, v0 is the register that controls the return value. 
So when you call a function, whatever is in v0 is the result of that function. Um, v1 is the second parameter and is also the second return value because MIPS is like older than the C hegemony. And um, it sort of understands having more than one return value as you might have in a language like Go or Python. Um, so in our first experiment, uh, we set up uh, the first word of our instruction being E820, which is a return. And we followed this by 6500, which is a NOP. This is our control case. Uh, if you ever fail to run a control case when trying to look for differences between CPUs, you're going to have a bad time. Um, so our next attempt was that we ran uh, E820 followed by F000. F000 is an extend instruction. And what this does is it says that it wants to add zeros to the more significant bits of an incompletely defined imme uh, immediate value. Yeah. But there is no immediate value in the knot that follows it. So on hardware, we found that this returns zero. On uh, QMU, in the, in the simulations, we found that it returned a bus error. The, the whole thing crashed. The process died. Um, and the, then we took just that case. And what we found was that when you ran F000, which is the extension, followed by the NOP, you got a bus error on both hardware and on the emulator as long as they're sitting alone. And then we did another experiment where um, the first word is the return, just as it was in our first two cases. And this is followed by the extension value. And uh, instead of a NOP, our third word was the addition function, uh, which is being extended but could have run on its own. And hardware returns a 0, and QMU silently returns a 1. And the reason for this is that in QMU, they're, they're pulling the full instruction however long it might be, which makes sense from like an x86 perspective, where all of your instructions are of unknown length. And from a given starting position, you always have to just fetch as many as might be there, up to 15 or 16 or 63 or whatever the limit is. Um, but from the risk perspective, where everything is of like a known fixed length, you don't have this luxury of knowing how long it will be. So you can't double fetch because this has to already be pipelined. And the bus error is avoided because the return is happening. And everything gets flushed away as you go from the child function state back to the parent function state. And this allows us to quietly detect the difference between um, uh, between hardware and an emulator in only eight bytes. So let's look at one of the, uh, some of those cases in more detail, right? Um, and uh, so this one's the first case that we were talking about, the second one on the table, which is a crash. So in this case, uh, we had the return, then the extension, then the NOP, right? And this is the one that in hardware returned zero, in QME returned a, a, a crash from a bus error, uh, and this is exactly to the reason that Travis just mentioned. But what can we do with this that's more interesting than just a crash, right? And this is where we get into, uh, next slide, anti-emulation, um, anti-sandbox. What can we do that's a little more offensive with that? So, you know, then we said, okay, so, so what can we do? We don't want to crash. We want to be able to differentiate if we're running in an emulator, if we're being reverse engineered, or if we're doing this in real hardware. And so that's where we added the uh, add immediate. So this is the entire uh, eight byte shell code that we created from this test case uh, that Travis talked about. When we put this into a C program, it looks like this. The exec shell code 16 function is just to go ahead and cast to a function pointer and, and add one to put it into MIPS 16 mode and, and run it. So uh, this is a program, and, and you can look at it. It says, I am running, and then we print out either in QMU or in real hardware. So as you look at this, think back to Alex's talk earlier today, as well as uh, the red pill that he mentioned as for CPU emulation, and think about the different use cases for this. And the, the best thing here was it actually worked, uh, at which point 
I think we were pretty happy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this works on a platform that doesn't have 1,500 instructions. It has like 26 that are carefully gardened that have been pruned down to just the reduced set that you need in a fixed width with regular rules. Um, and these sorts of things occur as hardware errata that compilers work around. They're documented, they're normal, these sorts of things are, are findable without, uh, without requiring fancy tricks. And they exist even on the smaller instruction sets, even on the things that ought to be small enough to be manageable. And so now what you're seeing is the output. So when the, the top screen is coming off an Ubuntu VM, running a QMU emulator, running this exact same program. And on the, the bottom screen, uh, this was being remotely run on a, uh, a router target. Um, and it, it correctly differentiated, as you can see from the output lines there. So that's one way to get around some security tools, right? To get around somebody emulating your, your firmware to try to figure out what's actually going on. But let's think about static analysis. And let's think, what, what does IDA see? So IDA Pro is designed from the ground up for x86 reversing. Since then, uh, whether by accident or by diligent work, it became the very best tool for embedded reversing. And most malware researchers don't really know that it's the best in that space. Uh, but it's true, they, they spend a lot of time on quality control. Yeah. And they make damn sure that their embedded targets, you know, for all of the jankiness of the GUI and for all of the times that I have to go down some random menu path that's more complicated than making a Windows command line more than 80 columns, like, their disassemblers are really good. And they understand all of the crazy extensions and they have modes for them. They're sometimes very hard to find. Um, in this example, I had to hit Alt-G and then change the MIP16 register from 0 to 1 in order to change the instruction set. On ARM, it will warn you, but on MIPS, it will not. Uh, but at the end of the day, you can get what's like to the right of my hand. You can see the instruction sets. You see that there's a, a move from the zero register to the V0 register, which clears the return value. You can see that there's a JR to the RA register, which is the return. Oh. And then that third instruction, uh, where it's adding an immediate extended of one value, uh, of the number one to the V0 register, you see that too. What you see in IDA is exactly what you see in the emulator. What you don't normally see in IDA, unless you turn on the view of the actual machine code, because IDA was first written for a DOS command line where you don't have enough room to include the opcodes. These opcodes you can include by going to the general menu, the options menu, and then typing in the number of bytes per instruction that you would like to see. Um, it's four bytes wide instead of two, and only the first two are executed. In and hardware. as we explained before, those become a no-op. So the reverse engineer and all of his reverse engineering tools say that this ought to return one, whereas the hardware will intentionally return only zero, because so, the hardware follows a different rule set than the the higher level logic would say. So looking at you know, how do we apply this to security tools or insecurity tools, hopefully you've seen a few things, right? That we can act differently. We, we have located, and to our knowledge, the first time that this was, was found, and this is the first time it's been spoken about, because we found it on Tuesday, um, is uh, you know, a, a way to do bare metal versus emulation detection on MIPS processors. And think of this as similar to what Alex mentioned earlier in his talk, the red pill from uh, Joanna in 2007, where there was an x86 instruction that behaved differently and was very difficult to change between the two modes. Uh, so we hope that this may be interesting to you for anti-security tool or for making a better security tool. Um, and uh, it may be interesting, so. Um, some other crazy stuff that you can do, like you can, um, you know, by hooking these illegal instructions, you can actually like 
make uh, one interrupt handler that allows you to run cross-assembled x86 code yep. just by expanding it to 32 bits per bit or per byte. You know, you can add bytecode interpreted virtual machines to your native code that the reverser might not understand at first glance, while hiding it among the native code at any random position. Exactly. So thank you to everyone who uh, invited us out, T Mac, Casey, Liz, Jessica, Gina, Ryan, who set this up and brewed all the beer for this, along with their other uh, neighbors and friends, the event sponsors who made sure there was beer to drink, uh, and to the people who let us uh, spend our nights on this instead of what they may have preferred us working on. Um, so for further reading, there's a few suggestions if this gets you interested. Um, there's a few other things you might uh, want to read. So th uh, the second two articles are like tourist guides that Ryan and I wrote in Paco GTFO to sort of introduce you to ARM and to MSP430 uh, assembly language. Um, the best article that I've ever seen on the differences between 32-bit and 16-bit ARM code comes from FRAC. It's FRAC 6612 on alphanumeric risk ARM shellcode. And at first glance, you might not really give a damn because it's been ages since you've need, needed to make shell code that's ASCII compatible. But when you actually read this article, they go through every logical step that was necessary in order to produce their shell code, all of the restrictions and the clever tricks that they needed. Uh, and it, it turned out that they needed a lot of crazy tricks. For example, in 32-bit ARM code, you have um, conditional flags for every instruction. So you, instead of doing a branch, you'll just say, like, execute this if the equals bit is set, and that if it's not set, as flags on individual instructions, never having a branch. Uh, in their case, they weren't allowed to always execute any arithmetic instruction. So they had to duplicate them, and they would execute some of them if greater than, and others if uh, less than or equal to. And this allowed them to sort of, uh, by the law of excluded middle, have a complete instruction set. Uh, reading through that will teach you more about the arm and thumb instruction sets than any other paper I can recommend. Cool. So we hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, we'll now take questions, but actually we won't. Uh, we have a question for you first, I think. So I've heard rumors that there exist C compilers that can compile C code from a big Endian module, uh, model of the world to run on little Endian hardware. I've not actually been able to find one. Uh, if any of you in this audience know how to do this or uh, know of any commercial solution, no matter how expensive, I would very much like to know. All right, uh, now we'll actually take questions. Yes. <laughs> that was just a trick. Cool. Uh, any questions from the audience? Are you guys just totally bored, or do you just want to go get more beer and have us shut up? <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, so uh, on that topic, if I can leave you with just one, one humble request. Um, this has been the most polite drunk audience I have ever <laughs> witnessed in my life. Like, you guys are really so quiet and attentive while drinking your beers. And that is awesome while people are on the stage. But Ryan and I are the very last performers. The show is done. There is now a happy hour. And during this happy hour, you can talk to each other. It's legal, it's allowed. Like, have a conversation, share crazy stories. Not all of them need to involve a shaggy dog. And like, have some fun. So thank you guys very much. Have a good day. Thank you.